புள்ளி ஒர்க் ஆகுதா எனக்கு தெரியுது ஆனா எனக்கு தெரிஞ்சு யூடியூப் லைவ்ல காமிக்கல நீங்களும் <laughs> 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 நீங்க யாராச்சும் வீடியோல இருக்கீங்களா இல்ல நான் மட்டும் தான் வீடியோல இருக்கேனா நீங்க மட்டும் தான் சார் சூப்பர் ஐ ஜஸ்ட் ஐ திங்க் இட்ஸ் ஓ யூ கேன் ஸ்டார்ட் எஸ் சார் गोइंग टू கெட் ஓவர் Yeah, Rachel, you can start, ma'am. Okay, sir. Very good morning to all gathered here for the International Alumni Series organized by JPI Institute of Technology Alumni Association and Bureau of Higher Studies of JPI Institute of Technology. I'm very glad to welcome Dr. N. Murray Wilson, Managing Director of JPI Institute of Technology, our guest for the day, Mr. Fenelon George, RPA Technical Lead from US, Dr. L. M. Merlin Livingston, principal of jpi institute of technology and all my dear fellow participants we welcome you all it is such a privilege to have with us mr fenelon george rpa technical lead and experienced robotics process automation developer with a demonstrated history of working in the insurance manufacturing and pharma industries skilled in use case identification and analysis design development and deployment of automation bots using ui path and automation anywhere he is a strong engineering professional with a master of science focused in computer science from pace university new york city trained and mentored individuals as well as conducted client training programs in robotics process automation using ui path we are glad to have you with us sir and we welcome you thank, thank you, you all once again for joining in and over to mr george thank you rachel thanks for the introduction and i would like to thank uh, our beloved director sir dr n mary wilson for giving me this opportunity to have this small presentation and have a small interaction with you guys and yeah so let's start over to our session so to begin with uh, i actually uh, i'm a to uh, passed out alumni of jpr institute of technology and i'm currently in us working as a technical lead in robotic process automation so i would like to share some insights on the robotic process automation technology and later on uh, talk about the things that we can do for pre- better preparation and the things that we do for uh, doing higher education in us so i would like to do the higher education part at the second uh, as a second part so that hopefully you guys would have a lot of questions on that so uh we'll start over with the technical stuff then go 
over with our uh, higher education plan. So to begin with, uh, so I'm as a technical lead at the in a robot Anybody process automation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Volume can be increased. So if you are getting it, uh, it's not audible much to us. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So can you hear me now properly? Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Increase your volume. That's enough. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. 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 Sir. Thanks. So yes. Uh, so we'll talk about robotic process automation today. So this is a very recent technology, and whenever robotics that comes strike to your mind, you just think of all these physical bots that you see uh, roaming here and there, and robotic bots taking over the robots taking over the entire world. But what we are going to see today, it's not any physical robot as such, but this is these are software bots. So uh, we would have heard about uh, Skynet, maybe we would have watched the Terminator series, you would have heard about Skynet. So uh, what I would say, maybe this would be a starting point to that uh, Skynet era. So, uh, so this is just pro automating processes. So traditionally, we, uh, we all know how processes evolved and from simple calculations to calculators, computers, and all those things. And we designed applications to work with multiple processes. Uh, for example, we have a uh, to make our work easier rather than going to a bank or going to any uh, different places. We reduced it to by banking applications online. So all these uh, applications came into picture. So that's when the development era was there. So where uh, Java, JavaScript, um, all those things were in place and you get all those applications were being developed. So now uh, we have come to an era where all these developed applications, we are still uh, upgrading it to run perfectly automatic. So uh, we have reduced our work from going to the banks to applications, and now we are still reducing it to just uh, for everyday activities, it's just automatically go to your stuff and uh, the software bots would do. It's not just a physical robot that does your work, but a software bot that can actually do your day-to-day -day work. So uh, talking about robotic process automation, so to uh, give you an overall definition, so what is robotic process automation? So as we all know, robots are used to mimic human actions, right? So it is just to ease the human efforts that we put in and uh, that's the same here, but instead of any physical robots, we are going to use uh, software bot. So it's completely a software that is going to work on applications and does the work for you. So again, processes, as we all know, it's a sequence of steps. So, and automation is something that is being done without any human intervention. So robotic process automation as a whole is a software bot that is uh, that follows a sequence of steps that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, without any human interaction. So that is what basically a robotic process automation is. So what are the uh, major attributes of a robotic process automation? So robotic process automation, it actually replicates the human interactions with any technology. So uh, there are multiple human interactions, like the basic examples are you navigate within uh, web pages, you click, you type in something, so you fill in forms online. So all these are like human interactions with the system. So uh, whatever you do with the system, uh, NORPA can replicate it or, and do it automatically. And so another important attribute is an RPA can be scaled up or down. So uh, you can actually uh, enlarge it from a single simple project to a very high level, high volume project very easily. So that, that can be done very easily using an RPA. And RPA actually operates in a user level. So when I say user level, RPA operates very similar to an user. So as a human, what you do to go into a application and do exactly what you need to do. So RPA will do exactly the same how, how a human user would do. So the major benefits as we see is cost. So yes, definitely there will be a huge reduction in cost because uh, almost 
half of our human uh, efforts will be taken out like the bots can run 24 by 7 right so there won't be any uh, like any lag or anything that has to uh, stop the bot from working so for example generally a human works 8 to 10 hours per day but a software robot can work 24 by 7 so efficiency since it's the automated process directly done by the system the efficiency of the work done is very high so there won't be any uh, so that uh, it can be explained in quality there won't be any accuracy issues there won't be any uh, human on errors so any typo all these can be avoided directly by using rpa and as i said before it's highly scalable you can start with maybe 100 uh, set of data and you can expand to hundreds and millions of set of data very easily so again speed so you know how the computer works uh, faster right so all these calculations can be done directly by the system same way all these user interactions that are made by the rpa work and since it's done by the system the speed is almost four times to uh, almost eight times the uh, speed of average human and uh, traceability and security it's highly secured it doesn't save any uh, data inside it, uh, the rpa technology because it directly works as a user so any user driven accesses or uh, are acceptable by the rpa so traceability it also tra- uh, allows proper traceability like uh logging so all the logs are captured so that it is high uh, for the business to do uh, reporting and auditing and yes as i said before it's 24 by 7 operations a bot doesn't take rest so a human can work only 10 hours a day whereas a software bot can work 24 by 7 right so another major characteristics of an rpa system is it uh, it is mainly used to automate manual processes so uh, which are highly repetitive and it's like a regular thing that you do daily for for example a basic example is uh, people do data entry jobs you just see from an excel sheet type into an application so people do these all the day so this uh, once they get tired there are uh, typo errors or possible so all these things are there so this the same thing pretty much the same thing for each row they have to just add it into the application so these are actually manual processes that a human has to go uh, have an input file so for example have an excel sheet and based on that he has to fill in an application form so this can be directly automated and also it is a replication of desktop action so that refers to a user how he does on the desktop it will done by that and it's driven by simple rules and business logic so any process that can be made into a simple rules can easily be automated by rpa and this can automate any existing software so if you are working on any software and you are doing any manual work on a daily day to day basis which are repetitive you can easily automate that with rpa so you, that's the uh, beauty of rpa and yes so some of the major uh, things that an rpa can do is it can open email and attachment so for example daily uh, on a uh, organization each employee used to check his email daily so you can actually use a bot or a software robot to go directly to the email and do all the necessary check or filters and say like if he wants this email to be read every day he can actually do that and it can actually log into any application it can move files copy and paste and fill in any forms so for example even for any registration you do you actually fill some forms so that is a manual data entry into the system right so these things can also be automated so for example if you are uh, if your job is to fill some forms like the daily in a daily manner so for example you have to fill uh, almost 100 to 300 forms per day a bot and a human average human would take a day to fill at least 150 forms so whereas a bot can do all these forms in maybe a couple of hours so that's the beauty of the bot working on a system 
and it can also extract data from any document. So if you have any PDF or if you have any Excel or a Word document and you need to get some data from that document, an RPA can be used to extract. So it can also extract data from the web and it can connect to any APIs, it can do calculations, it can it can also have some interactions with the databases. So any uh, thing you want to write or read from a database, an RPA can do. So it's basically uh, on a professional uh, organization, all these processes are done currently manually, which in future will be automated by RPA. So we have some limitations. So yeah, every uh, new invention will always have a limitation. So we have currently some limitations with the RPA and it's soon to be overcome. So uh, the major limitations are it can only mimic human action. So if you want to, uh, whatever you as an user do on the system, so the, an RPA can mimic exactly how you do it. And the other thing is it can uh, do only repetitive tasks with minimal changes. So the best, uh, the best explanation is like uh, today you are filling one form in one way and tomorrow you want to do it in a different way. This is uh, not a good candidate for RPA. So the processes should be repetitive and there should not be any changes from day-to-day -day life, right? So that's a major limitation of an RPA. And any process which requires human expertise. So when you work on an organization for a long time, you know, you do things based on experience. So all those things without any rules and you know by heart that you have to do this. So all those things cannot be automated because the system needs a written logic for it. So if you could write out any, if you could write any process as a set of rules, it can be automated by the bot. And it can also, uh, it, it also cannot read any unstructured inputs like handwritten data all those things cannot be read by RPA. Uh, it, currently, uh, they are in development by integrating computer vision technologies into RPA to make it uh, flexible to read unstructured data as well. And it can also not read any non-electronic data. Anything as a paper format, it cannot read yet. So you can actually, uh, you cannot read from the paper. And any multiple exceptions also cannot be handled directly by the RPA. So these are its basic abilities and limitations. So if you see of the enterprise benefits, you always, uh, so yeah, so the major processes, it's like a highly manual and repetitive. These are all the uh, things that we have discussed before. So anything rule-based process, you can automate, yes. And it has to have a low exception rate and your volume has to be high. So these are the major criteria that you need to figure out on a process before you start automating it. And the major benefits that you get are like your cost reduction is almost 85% when you use a software bot. So cost reduction includes resource uh, cost. So you'll there will be multiple uh, users working on an application which includes user costs like uh, their efforts and infrastructure cost, whereas a bot runs on a single machine and it can run 24 bar seven. So this can actually reduce the cost to almost 85%. And there can be increased customer experience. So for example, any banking system or any customer care that you call now, like previous days when you do call a customer care and to get your data on their system, it takes at least, they usually put us in hold, right? So for example, for five to 10 minutes, we'll be on hold. But nowadays it's like, when you give them the information that uh, that they need and they will pull out all of your uh, account details in maybe a couple of minutes. So all these are done on the background by the bots. So your customer experience has been increased. So the user who was waiting almost 10 to 15 minutes prior, uh, waiting for the account details to come up, now just waits maybe a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to just, you, once you give the information, he can, pass on the information and the bot will go fetch the data for him. So this will increase the customer experience and high scalability within minimum effort, yes. So we can, uh, from a process which is working with 100 set of data can easily be expanded to 
thousands and uh, hundred uh, thousands of data easily. So increased accuracy, yes, so, uh, humans uh, will do multiple errors. Like so, it's uh, based on uh, tiredness or based on like l there are a lot of factors that can cause uh, human errors, right? So that will reduce the accuracy of the process. Whereas a software bot working on the process will have very uh, it will have more accuracy. So it was very less to errors and increased return of investment. So uh, return of investment is basically the uh, investment that you put and the time taken for that investment to get completed and you get start uh, and you uh, start getting the profits. So this return of investment is very high since you know all, all these factors combined together, right? The cost reduction is more. So and uh, the cost of deployment is less. So which uh, results in an increase in ROI. And cycle time reduction is less than 75%. Yes, the time taken by a human working on a process is reduced to almost 75% when a bot works on it. So these are the major enterprise benefits working on working with the RPA technology. So like any other processes, RPA has the same delivery methodology. So it has a discovery phase where you discover, okay, what process you need to automate, what are the basic uh, requirements you need to gather, uh, and all the use case estimation, all those things, and then you go for the development where you do a development with the testing, and then you do a deployment. And then there is a stabilization phase. So here you deploy, the deployed bots are uh, actually, uh, it's a transitional period. So from uh, so once from the deployment till full automation, you will have actually two weeks of stabilization phase. You have to make sure everything is as per expected. And the last is the operations. The operations phase basically is, uh, it's like uh, pro production support. So uh, till the bots are running on the system, you ha actually have to do the uh, support for it. So another major beauty of RPA is unlike other projects which run for multiple years, RPA works one as in weeks. So your higher, the, your biggest project can work with like 12 to 15 weeks. So you can complete an entire big project in 12 to 15 weeks, where a small project will go for six to eight weeks. So that's basically you are looking at two to uh, six months period of time and your project is done and your, your software bots are ready for implementation. And yeah, so as we see, we have like multiple tools in the market. So RPA is basically a technology and you would need a tool to implement that technology. So you would need a, uh, uh, like uh, like a user ID that you that has an um, active interface for you to develop the board. You need to do the design. You need to do the development. All those pieces. So you need separate tools for it, right? So uh, there are multiple tools in market which actually support uh, helps us to implement this robotic process automation. And there are three major market leaders now. So the first one is UiPath, and the second one is Automation Anywhere, and the third one is Blueprint. And there are, again, multiple other RPA technology and uh, other RPA tools on the market. So they are based on multiple, uh, some are focused on only specific areas of automation, whereas the core RPA technology, as you see, you have uh, UiPath, Lucrism Automation Anywhere, Crayon, all those things are, they have all the, they are combined RPA capabilities, whereas the others have they are, they are focused on specific areas of the uh, system. So this is the RPA system. So next we'll like, uh, yeah, I like to show you a small demo just to, so that you could understand exactly what a RPA bot is, how does it work and all those things. So uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to go with uh, Yahoo Finance. So we are going to, the bot will automatically log in, uh, open Yahoo Finance, see multiple uh, companies. So these are actually based on, uh, so I have a uh, input for mail. So this mail contains a Excel file. So if you see the Excel file, it has, just okay. 
so it will have a company which you need to uh, know the value and it has currently five companies so this is my input sheet and this is what you will be getting as input and so if you see currently our input folder is empty and you don't have any output so this is basically i'm going to start a software bot so i'm not doing anything manually so just see how the bot is running and you could actually relate to all those talk that we had here so i'm going to start the bot so the bot has op directly opened so i'm not touching any system the bot has automatically opened google chrome for you it went into finance.yahoo.com and i don't have any input files on the file system right so it is there on my email so the bot is going to go to my email read the input file drop it into our input folder and based on that it's going to each and every company and get its value from the yahoo finance so yeah so looks like the network is a little slow Yeah, so it actually started. So it started writing in uh, Microsoft Corporation assets from the input sheet. It's going to extract the NASDAQ value for you. And it's like, it, this is something maybe any stock um, employee who has to go through all these companies to see what stocks they need exactly, go through the uh, previous data history of that uh, company and extract the data and let it have it for him to start his work daily on a daily basis. So this is basically an entirely automated system. So it's again, so for now it went to Microsoft, extracted the data automatically. And for each uh, company on the input sheet, it's going to extract the corresponding data from the Yahoo Finance and it's going to showcase it. So yeah, the time lag that you see now is just the uh, network time lag. So if you have a uh, good network, then this bot is pretty fast. So if your pages load as fast and yeah, now you can see it's loading. So that's the time it's taking, but you can actually imagine how you could do this manually and how long can it take? So yeah. So currently it had completed Microsoft, Amazon, Google. I think it still has two more to do. So all these are actually uh, done by a software bot on the system. So this is something uh, when you see it interests you, right? So it's, this, is, this would be the future, how you will be working with the system. You won't be directly doing any manual work. So anything most probably which can be, as I said before, we have some constraints on it, like any repetitive things, which uh, and it has to be set of rules, has to be defined. So all those things, if it matches, you can actually automate all those things. And maybe in the future, like they are still working, and this is just the starting technology. So currently it ha may have some limitations, but we are still like people are working on in adding artificial intelligence to it so that will and computer vision uh, to it so these computer vision technologies will actually enhance your handwriting recognition your voice recognition into rpa and so that like uh, if any handwritten notes also a software bot could read it and give you any result on it so that could be a computer vision technology and whereas an artificial intelligence. So currently this bot can run only based on a set of rules that you give it. So you can tell the bot to say, go, go here, do this, all these things. But once artificial intelligence comes into picture, you won't be uh, 
so the bots will learn for uh, learn themselves so if any small changes on the system the bot will be able to actually accommodate to that system and start working on it on its own so yeah so this would be the last So yeah, so uh, this, the bot has uh, completely run, and now when you come back here, previously there was no fold, uh, files inside the input folder. So this file, if you see, this is the same file from my email, right? So my email it has already read, right? So it was unread before. It was the bot has read this file, and it has downloaded it. And it has generated two outputs. So once the outputs are generated, it is also actually forwarded it to me. So this is my this is the email that is sent out by the bot. So whatever it has extracted, it has attached as an uh, attachment. So I can show you the attachments here. So this has basically taken the input file and based on the values from the Yahoo Finance for each company, it has filled in here. And this is a historical data that it actually navigated to and extracted the historical. So now I have just kept the top 20 historical data. So it is, has extracted all those into a single Excel sheet for each company. So just imagine how long will it take for a human user to do all these things, all right? So this is basically what RPA is. So it's going to automate your entire uh, user experience with the system. So we have developed multiple applications now, and once RPA comes into picture, it's directly going to automate pretty much everything. So it's, yeah, so there are multiple uh, drawbacks as well, and plus multiple advantages as well. So now people uh, actually cannot, like they don't have to do all these boring stuff like same data entry every day. Rather, they can just handle on many exceptional cases. So only the exceptional cases, so like any uh, interesting pieces that uh, the system cannot do, a human can do, right? So that's pretty much what an RPA is. And yes, so coming back, uh, so th yeah, that's, the end of the technical part that we have. So this is basically uh, how what we do, how um, what RPA technologies we implement for multiple clients. So it's just automating the employee, uh, like the user experience that we currently have. So next is study abroad, and yeah. So I actually yes, I graduated from JPR Institute of Technology, and I did my masters in. US, so I did it in Pace University in New, York, in New York City. So yeah, so I just want to give you some uh, high level insights. So how, what you need for, a, uh, how you can prepare and how you can get into any university in uh, United States, right? And so for preparation, there are some basic prerequisites that you would need when you want to, uh, when you think of planning, like when you plan to come to uh, United States for your higher education. So your prerequisites would be your undergrad CGPA. So CGPA or percentage based on your university you're in. So you will have either a 10 point CGPA or you will have a percentage. So that is wha what universities will look for. One is our CGPA. And next is we have GRE GMAT. This is a uh, this is an examination. So if you are looking for any MS degree, you would have to write a GRE. So, and if you are doing uh, looking for any management degree like an MBA, so you would have to write GMAT. So GRE and GMAT. And next is your IELTS or TOEFL. So this is basically your, uh, so we are basically non-English speakers, right? Uh, Non-native speakers. So we would need to write an English examination to uh, make us eligible to go into countries like US. So there are two different examinations that you could prefer. One is IELTS or the other one is TOEFL. Almost all universities in United States, they accept TOEFL. 
and nowadays uh, more and more universities are like they are also accepting IELTS as well. So one good thing about IELTS is TOEFL is only education based, and whereas IELTS you have the two different kinds. So you you will have education and general. So you can either write uh, if you are looking for any higher education, you can write education in um, IELTS. So next important thing that uh, every university in uh, US would require is a statement of purpose. So statement of purpose is actually a unique piece of document that has to be unique for every person. So you cannot actually copy even a single line in a statement of purpose. So your statement of purpose act, uh, should be unique. It has to tell uh, why, uh, who you are, what you did, and your basic experiences, your interests, and why did you prefer United States, and why this specific college that you have preferred. So statement of purpose should be, again, unique to a person and unique to different universities that you apply. So you have to specifically explain why you have preferred this particular university for your higher education. So that is basically statement of purpose. And then there is a letter of recommendation. So this letter of recommendation can be from any, uh, from your staff, uh, from your head of the department, or if you're currently working, you can get it from your manager. So there should be uh, two to three letter of recommendations. So minimum there should be two letter of recommendations at least. And you can have two to three letter of recommendations. And the, uh, the people writing your letter of recommendation should have handled you directly. So that is uh, one piece of uh, requirement for you uh, getting into US. So these are the five major important things that you would need before you uh, apply for any university. So you will have to have your undergrad CGPA, you will have to have your GRE or GMAT score based on what uh, stream you're going, whether you want to go to business, stream or like management uh, stream, uh, or if you want to go to general technical stream, uh, based on that, you will choose GRE and GMAT and either IELTS or TOEFL for your English examination, and then a statement of purpose, and then for a letter of recommendation. So these are your three requisites that should be fulfilled. And next is, and you have to know the admission period, right? So generally for us in India, uh, our school admission starts by June, right? June, July. And yeah, our college admission by yeah, this around the same time. So, and we always have a single admission uh, system in uh, currently in India. Whereas US has like two set of intake. So one we call it as spring intake, which your semester starts from Jan. And then we have a fall intake, which starts by end of August or and beginning of September. Same with the end of Jan or beginning of Feb. So these are two different intakes that you have. There are like uh, no, like there is no difference or there is no, uh, okay, so the fall intake is good or the spring intake is good. No, there is no restrictions like that. But uh, well, the only thing is some universities, the, uh, so most of the universities currently they give both fall and spring intake, but there are some universities they do, they do only fall and there are some universities they do only spring. So it's generally based on the, uh, university that you're trying to apply for. So, yes, so there are some myths uh, whenever you see, okay, so if you want to go for higher education, so immediately the things you hear is like, uh, you will be an international student in a different foreign soil and there won't be much, uh, you won't have any support kind of thing and you will be always looked down upon. So no, this is a myth, right? So the, um, professors of the universities are like they are they are very supportive and for every like you can uh, have multiple interactions with your professors uh, for clarification doubt clarification you can actually go meet them in person for any uh, any clarifications you need so there is nothing that uh, you will be secluded or you will be like uh, since you are an international student, like there is no uh, something like that, right? So the next is in US is unsafe and rude. Uh, this is again a myth. Uh, it's safe to say it's, it's a myth in maybe most of the places, but uh, yeah. So it's it's not actually unsafe. It is pretty much safe here in US, and 
you don't have to worry about any mess happening currently in the world and there may be some uh, some one or two places here and there but uh, once you are in you will actually know exactly what that is how you need to take care of yourself so you don't actually have to worry coming into us and the yeah, so the other major thing is it's uh, you have to choose your major right away so uh, there is uh, always like people say that um, us culture is like you just take one major and study only on that so and you have to choose it immediately when you start applying for a uh, university no this is not the case so choosing a major is like uh, there are multiple electives so almost most of your uh, course uh, syllabus is like not the syllabus most of your course subjects are electives so there will be maybe 3 to 4 mandatory subject that you would uh, that each university would require for you require you to take but all others are most probably electives so you don't actually have to choose your major right away but you can uh, so this is uh, you are you, ha- you will be choosing your subjects for each semester so you can actually choose your subjects based on your interest per semester so you don't have to choose okay so i have to go study only artificial intelligence so i have to choose artificial intelligence right from the beginning no this is not the case so it's like you will be selecting your subjects for each semester and again the education is tough to cope up the uh, so cope with. so this is uh, always this is not always the case so uh, the education system here the only thing is you cannot be a bookworm so if you are like a practical person you don't like mug up things and us is like they are mostly based on assignments that you do the like most practical work you do that's how you uh, get a good uh, score and uh, once you come inside an university so again another thing is applying to colleges in the us is centralized so there is no centralized application so you will have to apply for each university separately so each university have uh, their own criteria so some universities look for a specific gre score or some uh, like uh, from a bandwidth of uh, like one gre score and above so like they will have a specific bandwidth for iel score or so all these so each university so it's actually differ from each university and you will have to apply for each university separately so there is no centralized system so these are all actually myths and yeah so the major uh, okay so what you have to do okay so uh, how you want the, how it goes when you do uh, study in us is you have to choose your universities wisely so there are multiple universities and choosing the university is your major uh, that plays your plays the major role in your entire career in us so there are multiple universities offering multiple courses on multiple technologies right so not all company uh, sorry not all universities uh, focus on ai so, so some focus on artificial intelligence some have a major like a good courses in uh, data mining uh, data analytics data scientist so there are a lot of other uh, things as well right some are like more into programming stuff and any back end sql all those things right r programming big data and um, yeah so there are gaming so there are courses specifically for gaming so not all universities have all these courses right so some universities focus on some specific uh, technologies alone like some tech, uh, area of interest so based on your your area of interest you have to sort out your universities which provide uh, good courses on your area of interest so for example if you are looking for ai you have to find an university which has a uh, good amount of courses in ai that uh, so that you could take all those courses and make that your area of interest so next is it's based on a location also as well so the more uh, so you will have to have more the exposure or the, like yeah so uh, coming to us itself you will have much of an exposure but still if you are studying in any major cities uh, illinois new york uh, yeah there are uh, florida right so there are multiple texas right so there are multiple cities with multiple um, op, uh, like openings like 
there are uh, multiple opportunities in these big cities. So anything near uh, these cities would be uh, your best choice. And yeah, okay, so the next is all these uh, universities are like you. Uh, the education level is like it's basically based on your knowledge. It's, you cannot uh, like we do mostly. So if we, even if we, so for example, there are maybe multiple Anna University students here, and yeah, as we all know, we would write Anna University is like uh, you will write multiple pages. You for other things like when till your twelfth, it's whatever you study, you will have to mug up and write exactly what is there on the book. So all these doesn't work in US. So it's nothing on a book based. It's basically from the knowledge based. So the more uh, practical things you do, the more the assignments you do, that's how you how the education system is in the US. And uh, you don't have to worry about it. Like, don't think this is this will be very tough. No, there uh, all are like the professors will be very supportive for you. If you are stuck at any point, you can always reach out to them. And uh, yeah, the next is yes, they're helpful. They are liberal. Yet the only major thing you would have to think is it's like super punctual. So. If your assignments are due today at 12 a.m., uh, that's it. Even 12.01, your assignments will not be accepted. And if your class starts at uh, 9 a.m., it starts at 9 a.m., right? So they are actually super punctual in all these things. And that's one thing you will have to be careful about. And yes, yeah, so there are multiple range of electives. So if you take any university, they, they will have multiple uh, courses uh, on their curriculum. So they will be having courses from artificial intelligence, from any game programming, uh, from your uh, theory of computation, your internet uh, security, cyber security, web development. So there are multiple areas inside information technology, right? So uh, there will be multiple courses focusing on each of these area. So before we actually uh, select a course, we have to make sure, okay, so this is where I need to go. And you can choose your uh, subjects based on that. And yeah, it's pretty much hands-on. Uh, like I said before, you don't uh, directly study from the book or exactly write what is there on the book. No, that doesn't work. So your hands-on projects, your assignments, that would do the talking for you in US. And one another important thing is we do have international students council so each university has their own international students council so uh, for example uh, they help us so once you are in they help us find you boarding and lodging and you can reach out to them for any queries any visa related questions you can always reach out to the international students council and one uh, another good thing that they do is like any uh, Indian, uh, like not just uh, Indian. So any, all these internet, there are, there'll be multiple international students in each university. And this international students council would make sure that all the uh, international students, uh, they'll do uh, events, activities. And for example, they even celebrate Diwali here in the US. Like these international students council, they celebrate Diwali, they celebrate Holi. So they organize events for all these things and they do celebrate Chinese New Year, like a lot of other things, right? So that is, uh, they just make you feel like, um, yeah, so you will you will be pretty much enjoying the same uh, celebrations that you have back home. You will also have it here in the US. So the other thing is we do have a career fest. So each university have a career fest. So like a placement uh, session that you will be attending uh, in India, We'll be having a set of uh, career fairs. So what does career fairs do is they don't like uh, these career fairs are not like a placement uh, session. So companies, they don't come interview and uh, take you employee, uh, employ you there, there itself. No, they don't do that. The only thing is there will be uh, multiple companies coming to a career fair and you will actually have your chance to go directly to a company uh, HR and interact with them, get the details of the company, how you need to apply and all those things. So these are, uh, so the thing is you can actually reach out to your employers directly. So any company, it's not just smaller companies, right? So it's all the big firms 
uh, would come to a career fair you can directly go and meet the hr of amazon you can directly go and meet the uh, hr of google right so uh, these universities uh, do these career fairs so you can directly reach out to employees and uh, employers and um, you can get placed on and then you could reach out to them uh, apply for the positions and then take the interviews and uh, that's how the system works here so yeah so this is pretty much it uh, on your study abroad plan so how do you need to prepare what are the admission periods so what are the myths that currently we have and what are the uh, some major highlights that studying in us gives you so yeah so that is pretty much it uh, all the best for everyone so now we yeah, are so now we'll get to the q and a session thank you sir thank you so much for sharing the insights about rpa and also on doing uh, higher studies abroad so before we move to the q and a section we have a lot of positive mm -hmm. feedbacks coming up saying that it was a very wonderful session and was very useful as well um even we have a faculty telling that they are so proud to see you like this sir thank you sir thanks little thanks it's yeah yes, <laughs> all thanks to them so yeah they are they are only because of their guidance i'm here right so i yes, study yes. they guided me helped me to reach all these the heights so yeah i'm always thankful to all the staff members thanks for all your help thank you yes sir uh, do you mind telling us what brought in the drive for you to do your ms in a uh, us and to like take up this rpa course sir? can you just share your experience about that sir okay sure so uh, studying abroad i i had this as a goal from like very long time so even from my second uh, year from bachelor i was looking to go abroad do some uh, something interesting right so it's like uh, not staying here and the only major thing is us being a technologically advanced country you would get to know more of the technological advancement easily so uh, your the amount of exposure that you have is very high so i actually studied in new york city so the amount of exposure i had studying in new york city is tremendous right so and i like it's basically i have wall street by 5 minutes walk from a university and it's uh, it's pretty uh, good studying in united states where you get um, your thirst for knowledge right so it's like uh, it's not just that you do all these regular stuff uh, do your bachelor's go to a company sit uh, do some basic things that like do the development all those things right so here you would try to explore more and you can do many research oriented stuff and yes coming to rpa why rpa so uh, i on my masters i was like focusing on computer vision pattern recognition so uh, artificial intelligence all those things right so this is future now so uh, all these uh, development era is almost coming to an end so now we are like saturated with all the application and you will have to move towards the next step so all these applications have been already developed and the next step is how you automate those things so that's when this uh, rpa so this was pretty new uh, when i started uh, into rpa uh, the technology was pretty new and there was already multiple advancements into the uh, process automation technology so yeah so this is the future so i just wanted to cope up with that right so i don't want to lag behind yes okay sir thank you sir sir and now mm -hmm. after this pandemic so many of us uh, you know don't have a feeling to go and do our studies abroad so what what are the mm -hmm. future plans in us sir, for abroad studies if you want to pursue so what is your humble advice to us to take up studies abroad or to just do it in india no if you are passionate about uh, studying abroad you are always uh, welcome right so it's not, there should not be anything that is that should stop you from what you need so if you want to study in us yes you are always welcome to uh, come in so the 
all, uh, like there are some myths that what we spoke about before, right? That uh, there are these these this happening now in the US. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. Uh, that may be there, but once you are uh, into US, you will always find a way to survive all those things. It's nothing that should stop you if you want to pursue your higher education. And yes, higher education here is always helpful. So that's what I said, like the amount of exposure that you have in US, the amount of technological advancements that you have here, it's highly tremendous. So if you plan to come into US, yes, uh, you should do it. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, moving on to the mm -hmm. query session, queries asked by our participants. What are the challenges that we mm -hmm. face while doing a project using RPA? Okay, so the challenges faced is like RPA is always uh, how uh, it's basically based on the user interaction with the system, right? So the system uh, may respond poorly back to your RPA system. So some major uh, checks that you always have is, uh, for example, as you saw in the demo, uh, sometimes our system is kind of slow in response to the bot. And as a human, we tend to wait till it loads, whereas your software bot, it's uh, like almost eight to 10 times faster than a human. So when you type A uh, just for typing Amazon, just when you press A itself, your sub, uh, bot will complete Amazon and start going for the next word, right? So this is how fast the bot would go. So you will have to make sure uh, how your application responds to your uh, bot system. So that is one major thing. And the next important uh, thing is you have to make sure uh, your use cases are good candidates for RPA. So as I said before, there are some limitations for RPA and not all processes can be automated. So you would have to know exactly which process to automate and which should not. So uh, we saw some basic rules, right? It has to be manual repetitive steps and it has to be have a specific logic or it has, it, these processes can be put into proper steps. So yeah, if it fulfills all these criteria that we spoke before, it, it can automate. So you just have to understand your application, how it responds, and what are the inputs you have, and the complexities you have. If you could understand that, that would really help. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. So now how to use mm -hmm. bots in web services, sir? How to use bots in? Web services. Oh, okay. So uh, it, uh, bots basically whatever uh, a human does, it actually does. So there is nothing that you have to do with something differently in a different application or something like that. So it's basically uh, if a uh, user logs into a system, any web application, it replicates exactly how the user does. It, it doesn't have any background. It, it does not connect to any system through the background. It does exactly how a user does, right? So for example, uh, you go in uh, to a best example is maybe LinkedIn. So if you want to go into LinkedIn, you just open the LinkedIn page, type your username and password, then click login, right? So the bot replicates the same thing. So it will also open your LinkedIn page, type in your username and password and click login. So it will replicate exactly the user action. So whatever you do in a web service, a bot will automatically replicate that. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. We have one of our participants, mm -hmm. VVS Jayam, requesting you to recommend mm -hmm. some free courses to learn RPI tools. Okay, so we, uh, so now the currently uh, we have UiPath and Automation Anywhere and Blue Prism in, at the top uh, tools in the market. Uh, Blue Prism is a little restricted, right? So it's uh, you have to pay for your training, but UiPath currently is the top tool and you have all free trainings for UiPath free in your uh, in UiPath uh, website itself. So you have an academy trainings program specifically meant for UiPath. So it's entirely free for now. Just your uh, it's just the certification that you need to pay. So you can directly visit your UiPath.com and there you can go to academy training. It will ask you to sign in once, register once, and once you register your uh, trainings are pretty much free. And even Automation Anywhere, you have free trainings. So uh, some trainings are free, whereas some trainings are uh, paid. So 
you can actually take uh, almost eight you, you would uh, know the basics of automation anywhere all those things and almost 80 percentage of how you do the, all the development you can easily learn from online itself so you don't need to uh, pay anything for training session as such okay sir thank you sir so can you tell yeah. us the difference yeah. we face while working with ui path and automation anywhere Okay, so uh, both tools work on um, RPA. So RPA is just a technology and UiPath and Automation Anywhere are just the tools that is used to implement those things, right? And both has its uh, own UI. So what I feel is like uh, UiPath is more user-friendly. Like uh, it's, both are drag and drop tools, whereas working with U, uh, the UI, user interface of UiPath, it feels more user-friendly than an Automation Anywhere. This is a like this is for a, from a developer perspective. This is uh, this is one major point that everyone will put forward. The other uh, things uh, that I like so basically for for me, I prefer UiPath, and have worked in UiPath for like multiple projects. And the other thing is that I uh, feel in UiPath is UiPath has multiple options open and it can touch on multiple applications as well. So it has direct interaction with SAP and it has computer vision technologies already implemented. Like, so you can read from images, it will identify elements even in a remote session, right? So all these uh, technological advancements are there. The another major important aspect of UiPath is it has the uh, highest uh, set of community members that we have. Right, so we have, there are multiple uh, people which forms a UiPath community. They have a community forum. So there, it's like all the developers they have they join they uh, and it's easy to provide new activities or new drag and drop facilities, or you can actually uh, design your own plugin and upload to UiPath. So it's basically more developer friendly. Thank you, sir. Sir, and we have mm -hmm. a partis one of our participants, Gokul Atiraj, uh, questioning the impact mm -hmm. of RPA on BPOs and outsourcing. Okay, so uh, this impact of RPA, uh, yes, it will be on almost uh, every aspect of information technology. So wherever, wherever there is any manual interaction and there is any repetitive talk done by the user, RPA can be implemented, and this will always affect uh, any uh, area. So it's not just not restricted to BPO or any uh, other outsourcing firms. And one uh, major impact for uh, BPO or outsourcing is like, for example, uh, BPO uh, customer uh, satisfaction is there, right? So. People like there are what we call as a front end bots. So they are not actually scheduled. So once you get a specific amount of data, so response time, their response time is highly reduced. So that's uh, we discussed before, like you were waiting almost 10 minutes for a response. You will be uh, done in maybe a minute or less than a minute. So your response time is very less. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for patiently answering all our queries, sir. And now we are at the end of our Thank session. I request Ms. Mm -hmm. Cynthia Clarenda, Alumni Coordinator of JPI Institute of Technology, to give a thanking note. Please, ma'am. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Penn and George, for this wonderful session. It was indeed a great session about RPA and uh, UI path. Thank you once again, sir. And on behalf of JPI Institute you, of yeah. Technology, I would like to thank our beloved director, sir, Dr. N. Murray Wilson, for this great opportunity to conduct this Let's JIT chat by our alumni. It's a great initiative to have an interaction with our own alumni, sir. Thank you once again, sir. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank our principal ma'am, Dr. Ellen Merlin Livingston, for her support towards the session. Also, I would like to thank Mr. Mahindranath, sir, and Mr. Devanath, sir, for their support towards the alumni association. And Mr. Murli, sir, for uh, helping us through the YouTube live sessions. And also, I'd like to thank Ms. Rachel, Department of IT, finally a student, JIT, for a warm welcome address. Last but not the least, I thank all the participants for joining and especially for the active participants. Hoping to see you all in the upcoming session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I once again thank all the participants and I thank JPI Institute of Technology for having taken this initiative.
and thank you mr fanel and george for joining with us and sharing and spending your time with us today sir thank you thanks rachel thanks cynthia thank you sir thank you thank you fanelin thanks for your time and it's indeed a great pressure to have our alumni back to our uh, college and uh, explain a lot of things and it's really a joyful moment for us to see our alumni uh, in a globally recognized state thank you thanks for your time yes. and uh, thanks, thanks for your thank you thank you fanelin thank you thank you thanks sir yeah 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 bye bye thank you sir